best way possible, and I think she's got something that she wants to say to you moms first, so take it away. Yeah. Good morning. Um, I uh, normally, I was going to introduce myself, but obviously I don't need to do that. Um, normally I'm up here and leading worship and singing, um, but today I wanted to share um, with you kind of in a, in a different way. Everything about today is different, by the way. If this is your first time here, I don't know if you like it or not, but this is a, kind of a different day. And uh, I wanted to share, um, I think I have a unique perspective um, as James, James is my husband, um, just in sharing uh, this journey together as he pastors the church and I help him. So a little bit in the spirit of motherhood, you know, mothers are supposed to be nurturing and comforting, but they also have to tell you like it is. And they have to tell you what you should do. But really at the heart of a mom is, is to tell you what you could be. And so that's what I hope to do today. I hope to give you a gift. So I know I'm not your mom. <laughs> but kind of in that spirit of motherhood is the way I want to come to you this morning. Because I think I have a, something to offer. A lesson that I learned a long time ago that has... Um, stayed with me and that I would love to try and pass on to you. So let's pray. Jesus, uh, we do lift up our mothers this morning. Or we do pray that you give them strength, that they rely on you for all that they need. May they be blessed today. And Lord, we just pray for the rest of this service that you would humble us to hear what it is that you want to say. Amen. So, yes, I do come from Pastor James's house, but before that, I came, I've, I've grown up here in Watertown, and um, I uh, went to the school, actually, and I was reminded of something that happened to me a while ago. I was out watching um, the school play a softball game, and I... <laughs> I was reminded of a fairly traumatic thing that happened to me. I've been playing since I was a kid. I played baseball and softball. Um, I just grew up a tomboy. And even when I graduated, I was like 20, maybe 19, 20, and I was in this co-ed church softball league. And we were out back in that very field playing, and I was the second baseman. And we had this left fielder named Scotty. Okay. There's probably, yeah, see, there's a few people that know Scotty. Scotty was really tall. He's like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, very strong. He was, he's going to be the all-star on every team his whole life. Okay, He was amazing. It was like watching you know, the pros. It was like watching the World Series. He would dive. He would catch everything. He could hit. Every time he hit, it was a triple or a home run every single time. And the biggest thing about Scotty was he had this, like, rifle of an arm. Like, it just would shoot. It was so fast. He could throw a line drive from the stone over there from the road all the way to home plate without bouncing. It was amazing. And the guys that would catch it, these big, strong guys, they would catch the ball and they'd take their hands out of their glove and shake it because it hurts so much. And, um, of course, I'm second base, so that means I get to field a lot of those throws in from the outfield. And um, he threw it to me one day, just his normal, I'm throwing it, his normal rocket ship throw. And uh, normally, the, if you have, like, a kind of a line drive ball, it hits the ground at a glancing blow. Only I didn't realize there was a little divot lip in the field. And so instead of that glancing blow, you know, my glove is here. What it does is it goes, it hits this lip and hits me straight in the mouth. And so the ball comes, let's, let's pretend that my hand is like my two front teeth. Okay. If you can just envision that. I know it's a stretch, but just humor me. Here's the ball and my teeth do this. <laughs> And it knocks me on the ground, 180. Everyone said they could hear the thump from the other end of the field. Yeah, good times, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, I have to go to the emergency room, the whole works. My dad was, I've never seen my dad speechless, but 
He just... I mean, he's at the emergency room, I'll never forget, and he has his hands on his face. He goes, oh my word, you come down. Oh my word, you look at me. And I thought, wow, I must be pretty ugly right now. <laughs> this is not, not looking good, not sure about my future anymore. Uh, <laughs> Luckily, all I had to do, I mean, they took x-rays and everything, but all I had to do was push my tongue forward with a tongue depressor for the weekend, or not my tongue, my teeth, and they actually got back in place. And look, I'm here to tell you that I live to tell the story. So, uh, <laughs> that was that. But, you know, how do, I, how do you think I felt about going back and playing after that? How would you feel? Some of you are like, yeah, I'm fine. But a lot of us would not be fine. No. And I, I played it off like I was okay, but I wasn't. Mm -hmm. I was never the same. Mm -hmm. I finished that season out, and uh, I, I quit. Because every time the ball came at me, if it was kind of fast, I would do this. And if you play it all, you, you can't move your head, because you will get hit if you do that. You have to be looking at what you're doing. So... <laughs> I just quit because I kept thinking, what if I get hurt again? What if that happens? You know, I, is it really worth it? That's what I was thinking. Is it really worth it? And there's something interesting when you go through a battle or you go through suffering. Because what you think about when you're suffering reveals what you think about God. And We've been talking about Job the past couple weeks. And in case you don't know, there's a man named Job who is like the best servant, the most faithful servant of God. And he has all kinds of wealth, and he's very blessed. And one day, Satan comes in to basically orchestrate the destruction of his life, and his whole family is dead. He's lost all of his wealth. He's lost his health, and all he's left with are friends that accuse him of things he didn't do, and a wife who is pretty miserable and says, you should just curse God and die. Why keep your integrity? But Job doesn't quit on God. He gets pummeled by the devil, pummeled by suffering. He wants to die. He's very clear about that. But he doesn't quit. He doesn't sin. And somehow maintains his faith. And I don't know about you, but I think this is what a lot of us think. Good for Job. <laughs> Good for Job, but I could never do that. Right? I could never do that. My whole family is dead. I've lost all my wealth. My, my skin is covered with boils. I'm depressed. I have no support. You can go through a lot, but if you don't have anybody to go through it with you, you don't really want to continue. But there's this amazing song, the first one, which is quite different than the rest of the book. And I think it speaks to how Job was able to do that. It may not look like it at first glance, but as we travel through, I think you may see how Job was able to stay true. So let's, let's just read through it. It says, this is Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way that sinners take, nor sits in the seat of mockers. But his delight is the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree, planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does, shall prosper. Sounds too good to be true. And then it ends with, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. So if you spend time looking at this, what you'll see is there's basically two paths and two choices. That is, you can be a tree or you can be the chaff. You can be a tree or you can be the chaff. And it seems... By the way, if you don't know what chaff is, it's just like the casing of a seed that blows away once you go to put it in the ground. It's completely useless. You could think of it as ash after a fire. It doesn't do any good. So we have completely two opposites. You can be the tree or you can be the chaff. And 
I have often thought, and I'm guessing that someone else here, here has thought that, is that seems kind of extreme. It seems a little bit odd, like, really, I have to be perfection or I'm just totally wicked, right? There's no third way, there's no, nowhere in the middle, <laughs> right? That's, I mean, me, naturally, that's what I think. There's got to be a way to be in the middle because I feel like most of us are in the middle. I know a few really wicked people. And I know not too many perfect people, but I think that we'll discover that the third path is the chaff path. Let's say that together, shall we? I'm a teacher, so I'm going to make you say it with me. Ready? Here we go. The third path is the chaff path. That's so catchy. Should be in a should be in a rap or something. Anyway, so. Um, why is it? Why is it? Well, let's just take a look at that first verse. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way the sinners take, sits in the sea of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And I look at that word meditate and the word delight, and I realize that's really the key there, the key to determining what path you're on lies in what you delight in. Because what you delight in is what you meditate on. What you meditate on, we think of it as this home experience, right, where we just empty our mind of everything, but you know what it is. You know what you ponder about. What you quietly think about when no one else is around, you have a moment to yourself, you lie awake at night. You know what you dream about, what you're plotting to do. That's what meditating is. What do you meditate on? And what you meditate on is the barometer for where you're at with your faith. What you think about is indicative of the depth of love that you have for God. And so in this verse, there's a progression. First thing is, you walk, right? And you question God. And you say, if God was loving and powerful, then he would have done this, or he would have made me this way. You know, if God was so great, how can he allow this other person to do well, but not me? I didn't do anything to deserve this. And you, you start to mill on those thoughts, and you turn that over and over, and you meditate on that. And the second thing is, is you stand. You stand in it. And this is what I call Jesus plus. Okay? You begin to add some things to your coping regimen, right? So instead of just relying on Jesus, you need to add things to your faith. I trust in Jesus and I trust in this. Here's a little list. Uh, Jesus plus my image. Jesus plus my, my pride or my status, Jesus plus my wealth, my success, my achievements, my accomplishments, Jesus plus my unhealthy relationships that I will not let go of no matter what, Jesus plus my addictive behaviors that I also will not let go of no matter what. Jesus plus my secrets that I should tell, but I am not going to. I will take those to the grave because nobody will know about them. Jesus plus. What are you thinking right now? What's your plus? We all have one. I have one. And who do you think wants you to have that thought. <laughs> Who do you think wants you to have the plus in your faith? It's the same person who tried to destroy Job's faith, who wanted Job to think that his love was conditional, his love for God was conditional upon God's blessing and favor. Who do you think wants you to have all of those extra things that you need in order to feel okay? It's the devil himself. 
It's the father of lies. All those things you just have to have. Who wants you to chase after those? And what he wants you to do is he wants you to sit in that sin and just say, it's not worth it anymore. I quit. I'm done. I'm out. I, and, and most of us are here today probably because we're not quite there. And I'm not saying you're anywhere. I don't know where you are. I just know where I've been. I spent a lot of time in number two. I spent a lot of time in the middle. When I could see, looking back, that the devil absolutely was trying to pull me away and so that my suffering would cause me to just quit. And the devil's design is for you to be like chaff. It's not much use, is it? But God's design is for you to be a tree. That's God's plan for you. And that's the good news that we have today. You can't be half a tree and half of something else, can you? And I, I brought that, that image up of just being like one thing or the other. How can we do that? It's not about being a zero or a ten on the scale of Christianity. It's about what you delight in. It's about what you meditate on. Because that puts you on the path that you'll end up on. What if your heart <laughs> spent meditating on what's actually true? Why? Why would you do that? Have I convinced you yet? I'm not sure. Oh, this is pretty cool, I think. If we look at that, that other verse, it says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. You should do it so you can prosper. It's a good reason. But prosper is tricky because I've seen really wicked people prosper. I've seen them be rich. I've seen them be wealthy. I've seen them have power. I've seen them get away with all kinds of things. And it just seems like they can do whatever they want. And everything's just fine. And here I am doing what I should be doing. And I don't prosper. Well, I think that's because you have this... We have this worldly view of what prospering really is. And if you look at this whole book of Psalms, it's different. And we think of the law as, as just a list of rules. But if you look at the whole book of Psalms, it's not just the rules. It's knowing who God is. It's knowing what his intentions are. It's knowing about his forgiveness. It's knowing about all the stories in this book. It's knowing how they relate to one another. The law is about knowing God. And this, the, the water that gets pushed into the roots of the tree, into you. If you look later on the book, in the book of Psalms, it describes that river as God. God is the river of your foundation. So why do you prosper? What does it mean to prosper? Because you're going to go through all kinds of of things. And like we heard this morning, you're more than a conqueror. Think about that. You're more than just your success. You're more than just your achievements. You're more than just your image. Thank God you're more than your failure and your regret. You are more than a conqueror. And from now on, if you choose to, everything that you do that is in line with following God becomes eternal. It's not just, I go to work on every day and then party on the weekends. It's not just, oh, i got to make a certain amount of money. This, those things like don't matter. They don't matter at all. We base our lives on things that don't matter at all, all the time. And when you choose to meditate and you choose to delight in who God is, You can plant trees. Not only do you become a tree, but you can plant trees. Trying to prosper without God is like trying to grow a tree without water. Can't be done.
We'll put that tree in the ground. Give it lots of sunlight. You can walk by it every day and wave. But if you don't water it, it won't grow. And we often try and prosper without the only thing that will make us do that. I want to share uh, another little story. This is actually just a couple of years past uh, my horrible tooth incident. I don't even know what to call it anymore. <laughs> but um, I was about 21, 22, and I had been studying school in Potsdam. I was away from home. And uh, I was studying music there. And uh, it was kind of a hard time for me. Not kind of a hard time. I mean, it was like a really hard time. It was a very dark part of my life. And I uh, was battling a lot of insecurity. To make a long story short, there was a lot of ways that I was behind the other students. And um, I had to practice like five times as much as every other student in my studio. And they would show up hardly doing anything for rehearsal. I'd spent hours doing it, and I could just barely pass. And they were amazing. I, I'm like, well, how? Why? It's one of those situations, right? Like, I'm the one working hard. You don't work hard. And yet, you get all the compliments, and I'm like, yeah, OK, great. So anyway, things are difficult. I'm really stressed. I stay at school till it closes, 11, 12 o'clock at night, every single night. I get there when it opens. I'm burning both ends of the candle. I'm kind of becoming obsessed with how good I can be. And in some ways, I'm, I'm kind of getting there. But in other ways, I just felt like I could never measure up. And I was never enough. I was sick all the time. I kept a little bottle of Pepto-Bismol in my locker. And I used that puppy every single day. I was always nauseous, felt sick every time I ate. And to top it all off, I was in the middle of a season of grief because my mentor had uh, recently passed away. He died suddenly, he had a heart attack. And I was just really wrecked by that. There was a lot of my future that I thought he was going to be a part of, a lot of milestones I thought he would be there for. It's hard to know what your future is going to look like when somebody that's an integral part of your life is suddenly gone. And I would pray, but I didn't feel what I was supposed to feel when I prayed. It wasn't emotionally satisfying. And I would try and read the Bible, but I just, eh, you know, it just wasn't doing it for me. I didn't spend a whole lot of time with it even though I knew I should. I'd go to church, and it was okay, but it was sort of like I just envisioned a ping pong ball being thrown against a concrete wall, like nothing stuck. It just, it just bounced right off. And I think looking back, whatever efforts I made to be a Christian was simply so I would get out of going to hell. It wasn't because I loved God. <laughs> Because there's no third path, there's only one or the other. And my delight wasn't where it should have been. And I, I realized it wasn't just wrong, it was wicked. It was wicked to know what God had done for me and kind of treat it casually. It was wicked to look at my Bible and say, eh, it's not doing it for me. It was wicked. And what was growing in my heart what I was pondering about was really about how I could make my life better, how I could make myself feel better. And I was oblivious to some of the people around me that were in such pain. I didn't even know it at the time, but my roommate was suicidal. She was cutting herself. She was bulimic. Eventually, I kind of came to, I was able to help. But for a whole year, I was just blind to that because I was just, in my own little head, my own little world. Because God was supposed to fix my problems and make me feel better, right? So I'll, I'll, never, I'll never forget this. It's like a movie in my head. I was walking out of Crane 
on the side street where there's a loading dock and if you're smart you park on the side street not in the parking lot so i'm walking out of there and i would go across the parking lot and i could feel the sun hitting my face and it was like at that moment where the sun hit my face god just broke through the noise in my head he said nicole this is why people leave me Because when you go through suffering, you don't understand. I don't meet their expectations. We have an idea of who God is and what he should be. Instead of actually discovering for ourselves that he's so much better than what we want him to be. And so I had a thought. It's It's a good one. If you ever have this thought, you should hang on to it. I thought, I need help. I think I need a friend. I was really homesick. I didn't have any friends. And I kept myself so busy, it didn't matter. I wouldn't have made time for them anyway, because I had to be this amazing musician. And I had, uh, I was going to a small group in the college ministry. I knew enough to do that. And this one, one friend, her name is Lori. She kept asking me to come hang out at her apartment. But I thought she was just asking me out of obligation. I have like a hypersensitivity to that. Like, do not ask me because you think you should. I don't want that kind of friendship. I want you to be my friend if you want to be. You know, like, you got to want me. Okay, you got to want me. So <laughs> I just ignored it. She asked me, I don't know, three, four times. Most people would think by the third or fourth invitation that maybe this is real, but not me. A little insecure sometimes. And uh, I just thought, you know what? I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to try it. What else am I going to do? I don't want to go back to practicing. It's a Friday night. So I decided to drive over to her apartment and uh, getting out of the car. The whole way there, I'm driving. I'm like, this is dumb. Why are you doing this, Nicole? You should just turn around, right? Anybody have those thoughts? You're on your way to the thing. You're like, is this? No, this is bad. But I just had enough faith left in me to try. All right, every step her apartment. What is she going to think? She's going to be upset. Maybe she's not even there. She's not even expecting me. Why am I doing this? This is so dumb, but I'm desperate. You kind of get to a point and you realize you don't have much to lose. So I knock on the door (laughs) and I hear, come in. I'll never forget the look on her face. She lit up when she saw me. She goes, you came. You finally came. Me? You wanted me to come? See, somewhere along the way, I knew that God loved me. But it was an entirely different thing to see the love of God coming through someone else right there, physically there. I needed it. I needed it. She was my tree. I needed something to hang on to that wasn't going to move around. And God planted that tree right in my way. Because that's what he wanted me to be. And she showed me something. I, I had plenty, plenty of opportunities to learn how to study the Bible. And I actually knew how to do it. I just, I never really realized how important it was. And so with her, she would unintentionally she's the one that taught me to meditate on the word she's the one that taught me to like look at what what the author was going through look at the time period why was it written who was it written for that verse is confusing why don't we actually go back and look at it instead of brushing by it she didn't use the bible as a spiritual encyclopedia Ooh, what am i interested in today verses on depression let's look that one up yeah that'll encourage me she said let's look at the whole thing And as I looked at the whole thing, I saw something. So I, I heard this the other day, and I think it works really well. It's one thing to have an opinion that God loves you. It's another thing to know that God loves you. 
And I was wrestling with this opinion. And as I looked through the scripture, and as I ordered my schedule and my life around being able to prioritize him, I looked at that and I thought about it and I talk, we'd talk about it together. What happened to me was, I said, God, I don't really understand why he died. I don't understand why no matter how hard I try, I can never be good enough. But I know that I can trust you. And I know that you are all I have always had. And I know that you love me. The best part about that, I think, is that in a way, you can be her. You can be that tree in the middle of whatever it is that you're suffering from. I didn't know this until I had gotten to know her for a while, but she, she was going through a hard time. She had just gotten back from spending a year as a missionary in Guatemala where she contracted an incurable disease. It wasn't life-threatening, but it made her feel pretty unwell. She just felt sick all the time. I also didn't know that her family was being ripped apart and her mother was abusive, emotionally manipulative. I've been sick, I've been abused, Ever had your family blow up? Her brother, her little brother had died about two years ago. I didn't know. And yet she was a tree to me. And she moved and I ended up taking on that small group. And I end up being able to kind of follow in her footsteps a little bit. And try and be a tree for somebody else. Because trees reproduce themselves. They keep growing. And they make more. And they make more. I have to think, what if she hadn't bothered, right? I'm sure God could have sent somebody else. But I'm sure glad God... I'm glad God sent her in the time that he did. And so I just want to tell you today that you can do it. You can be a tree. There's so much more than your suffering. And do you see why you can't have that third choice? It's all about what you delight in. We, uh, we often have a hard time with that, you know, and, and, and I think God has this, he has this mentality. We have the same mentality, but we don't necessarily realize it, and that is you either want me or you don't. And that, that seems extreme, except for when you personalize that a little bit. I'm like, you know what, I don't want to have a relationship with somebody that only half wants to have one with me where they're with me but they're thinking about going to do something else or I never know if they're where we stand. I don't want that and you don't want that either. And neither does God. And so you might stumble along the way. But just like any relationship, you don't expect it to be perfect, but you expect that in the end, they're gonna, still going to want to be with you. They're going to want to be committed to you. And so my question is today, do you want to be a tree? What if we all decided to do that together as a church? What would happen if we met together? What would happen if we discussed what it is to know God and who he is and make him what your life is about and prosper because now your mind is thinking about what's eternal, what actually matters. Because I think you want your life to matter. We passed out these 
small group commitment cards because I wanted to give you an opportunity today while we're here in this moment and you're thinking about whatever I just said to do that. You have a chance. Will you commit? Will you commit to knowing God? Because you can't do it on your own. I couldn't do it on my own. That's not his plan. Let's do it together. Let's do it together. Maybe you don't know anything about the Bible. It's a great place to start. <laughs> Maybe you think you know something like I did. And there was a lot that I missed. So I invite you. Maybe you're terrified to go. Just fill it out. Put it in the car. Just, just do it. You don't even have to go. You could just talk to somebody about it. Just fill out the card. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we... God, we repent for the places that we have turned to instead of you. God, we repent for the things we have put our faith in, for the things we thought would be good to us when you were the only thing that is good to us. We repent for taking your word and your law and just kind of tossing it aside and making up our own way. We repent this morning. And God, I pray for my friends here today that they would feel a wind at their back, Lord. They would feel your streams going into the roots of their soul. God, we want to be trees. And so, Lord, we commit our way to you today. If you, uh, amen. If you want more prayer, we'll have a prayer team available this morning. We have a table in the back. There's a volunteer there. If you have any questions about those groups, you can turn that card in there. I'm so glad I could share with you this morning. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. Have a great day. We'll see you next week.